Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report for Hour 3, our Civil Defense Preparedness Earth Changes Hour, and we have our experts. John Morrow has some very important news, and Morrison will be joined uh, later with Christina Consolo on radiation Fukushima. Also, Earth Changes occurring with the release of very foul sulfur-like material around the world, many places, including the Salt and Sea here in California. These are often a warning sign of earthquakes that are impending, and Alexander Bachman as well later on in the hour. Um, John, what's the latest news? Well, uh, in addition to what we talked about privately, I got some breaking news in the last hour. But what we talked about privately earlier today was uh, the fact, and it's been confirmed from three independent sources now, that there has been, there may still be this uh, this week, a confrontation on the Pacific Ocean just uh, west of uh, San Francisco between the People's Liberation Army Navy which is the Chinese Navy, and the United States Navy. Uh, we don't know any more than that uh, from my sources other than the confrontation did take place and may still be taking place. Uh, you and I talked privately about your thoughts on why the Chinese would be doing this regarding their economy and, and how it's not growing at the rate it should be. Yeah, the linkage is this. Um, China has a lot of uh, very good engineers and scientists, but their economy wouldn't grow at all if the globalists didn't and the insurance companies and the governments didn't, in a sense, mandate the tremendous amount of pension funds and insurance money to be spent internationally to be actually hiring at, at 6.5 times less wage Chinese engineers and workers. And what they've done is shipped a lot of our businesses, 50,000 factories have closed in America, gone to China, Indonesia, uh, India, etc. And what that's done, <clears throat> what's happening now in this last year is the brakes are on. Their uh, economy has dropped, so now they are generating 10 new employees that are qualified with training, education, uh, but only one job per month now. Their, their economy, in terms of their trade balance, has dropped from 22.47% increase last August of 2011 to only 2.7% this August. So China is on the verge, and by the way, if their economy crashes, which could happen very quickly, uh, they're a production economy. They do not have a large middle class. They don't have a large, if you want to call it, to sell their, their goods. So they're actually storing them. They have giant warehouses where they store the excess they produce because they can't close the factories and just send people home. That's uh, incredible. What will happen in China, basically, the linkage is this. <clears throat> There's a $240 billion oil, gas, and ethylene contract. The largest source for ethylene to make plastics to make Christmas toys and decorations for you, believe it or not, is Iran. Iran sort of supplies the ethylene. The largest, the second largest gas producer in the world is Iran. The, they don't even have, have factories because we blocked them for over 35 years to have their own gasoline, so they have to buy the refined oil products back from China. Now, what's happening is China, if, if, we block, if we attack Syria and Iran, they won't get their requisite oil and ethylene, and their industries will, will grind to a great extent to a halt. Uh, this is considered an economic attack on on the uh, giant nation of, of China, which, by the way, right now is not number two. It's number one in terms of industrial output on the planet. America's not number one anymore. We're number two. That doesn't we surprise have, me. Well, yeah, the, the second update um, about an hour ago, uh, a very a very good friend that I've known for 24 years, here, uh, tightly connected with high levels of the military, he says that... Uh, the uh, remodeling going on at the White House, uh, allegedly to do uh, electrical upgrades, has actually been a project to build a uh, shelter 60 to 100 feet deep beneath the White House, uh, part of a project which will be expanded to uh, be large enough to have the entire White House staff in this shelter, and of course it will be connected to the uh, Underground Railroad uh, that's, in, that's underneath Washington, D.C. as well. Uh, right. the, the point being, uh, the powers that be don't feel there'll be enough time to evacuate their people, and they they want a place where they can just take an elevator, get down in the shelter, and then be, be evacuated by train out of yeah, Washington. Yeah, by train to Mount Weather and other places, uh, Mount Weather, Virginia. Mount so. Weather would be the logical location, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, that, that makes sense. I think that's a good idea. Um, I think what we're really dealing with is the linkage is this. If we attack Syria... Iran will send missiles at Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, almost immediately. And this is not going to be like a small arms war. It'll be a missile war immediately. 
it'll also be a jihadist war, which means uh, the the uh, Muslims who are already embedded here, and again, we're going to have Alexander Bachman later, but I know this is a fact going right back for years, talking to many people like George Groover, Henry Groover, and uh, other people who've had prophetic visions, that <clears throat> we have embedded Muslims here, many of them paid for by Iran and by these Muslim countries, to embedded in North America, Mexico, and the United States, and they're ready to, to, to do mayhem if we attack uh, their countries. Absolutely. Well, if you look at the Drudge Report today, Dr. Bill, you'll see there's been multiple incidents in universities around the United States of uh, uh, threats of terrorism uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, they evacuated the entire campus because of threats of bombs. Uh, a number of incidents around the United States. I think we're just getting started on this. Well, I think what it's what going to come out of it, and uh, believe it or not, the globalists want this. They they actually want it because most people don't realize. Uh, here's a question: What do you think the civil detention camps are that they built, like a Camp Pendleton and elsewhere? Who do you think they're for? Well, I think they're they're. They could be either refugee camps, or they could be detention centers for people they they consider to be. Well, enemy, I, which could be Islamic I, people. They could be. So my my source is that these are not for illegal immigrants from Mexico. The number one reason for them being built, overbuilt with all these high security, is for Muslims. That's the number one, two, and three. When you get down to number four reason, yeah, they want to put some illegals that may be, you know, prone to violence. Most illegals that are working in America are working because they're trying to support their family back in Mexico. Right. Uh, the small percentage are, are criminals. It's very small. They're usually very strong family people, and we don't have a rational policy for the republic caps. So what I see happening is. Uh, very unfortunate because Romney and Ryan should win this election is handily over Obama. Um, not that we have, you know, we don't have great alternatives to that, but um, they're certainly far better than Obama. But I'm very concerned that they may not win because the handling of a number of policies has been pretty bad. It has been. It has been. Dr. Bill, I know you got a lot of guests waiting, and, and this uh, remaining 45 minutes will fly by. So yeah. I'm going to bail out of here and let you uh, work with Ann Morris yeah, so that, and that's, Alexander and so forth. Yeah, that's and, very uh, important to kind of uh, realize exactly what's happening in terms of the military strategy. Uh, the other thing I think that we're likely to be seeing is the government knows that natural disasters are about to strike. And when all oh, this yeah. releases sulfur all over the planet in different places all across the Midwest and other countries. You mean it's not dying it's, fish? No, it's not dying fish. <laughs> this dying fish theory, yeah, this dying fish theory is a pile of, of as they say, what's uh, rotting in Denmark is not dead fish on the dock. I'd, I'd hate uh, to see what 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 a, what a big pile of fish it would take to smell it from a hundred miles away. Right. What, what we're dealing with is release of salt, hydrogen sulfide and other gases from deep in the bowels of the earth before a major superquake. So uh, what's likely to happen is the San Andreas Fault is ready to rip. The Sea of Cortez, we had a 7.6 last year. The all on the San Andreas Fault, we are due for well, a big one. You know, everybody coming. on this panel can remember when earthquakes and volcanoes would be news maybe twice a year. Now it's weekly, if not daily. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, anyway, yeah, right. Ann and, and Dr. Bill, I'm going to bail out of here and let you guys carry the show because you got. Yeah, a lot I really to appreciate talk it. By the way, you should listen to John's show at 7 to 9 a.m. Republic Central Standard Time, Republic Radio, TheLibertyMan.com. Thanks, John. And Thanks, uh, any any, major, any emergency reports, give me a call and we'll get Will it up do. on the uh, on okay. our show. Thank you. John, was that confrontation with submarines? I uh, don't know. Uh, I would not be surprised, but I simply don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good luck. My, my guess is it had something to do with probably some missile firing, because we there was some suspicion off of Port Magoo that that incident that happened was actually a Chinese missile off Point Magoo, California, which is just north of L.A., and uh, our missile defense picked it up in Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is where the real space program is. Saw that missile and eventually and didn't realize that the Chinese submarine was off our coast, which basically we can reach out and touch someone. In other words, the Chinese are saying, like, don't mess with us. We have pretty advanced technology, and if you do, we'll crawl right up your your back doorstep, and that's what they did. Amazing. Back in a moment with Ann Morrison. We're going to be joined with Christina Consolo and Alex, Alexander Bachman. Uh, Christina, we drop coming on the bottom of the hour. Stay tuned. Preparedness, civil defense, earth changes, amazing reports. Welcome back to the Nutri Medical Report, and you have a report regarding the salt and sea. Uh, the dead fish theory, which is that dead fish are 
and the wind is whipping up the uh, waters there, causing air quality even as far away as Los Angeles, 100 miles away, I think is a dead fish theory. Uh, I think we're dealing with bowels of the earth, presaging as you, as Maria Consola will come up at the bottom of the hour, she has some historical reports that before any major quake around the world, you can smell sulfur. In other words, you smell the breath of the dragon before the earth qu- uh, starts to sh- shake, rattle, and roll. And uh, <clears throat> But there's going to be some major problems if they do what you're mentioning here to the air quality. Tell us all about it. Well, you remember over in Italy when the um, seismologist detected radon and he says, you know, there's going to be a big earthquake. And uh, they laughed at him, and a week later they had, what, 50,000 dead or 10,000 dead or something because there was a big earthquake. Well, the same thing happens with uh, sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and that's the rotten egg smell that they were smelling 150 to 200 miles away from the Salton Sea. Now, everybody agrees that the smell came from the Salton Sea. <laughs> they just said, but it's like they don't talk to the weatherman. They said, well, the fact that it blew that far surprised us. You know, the the connection between the National Weather Service and the and the uh, geologist is tenuous at best. Anyway, uh, what they're they, doing they missed those classes in university, I guess, right? I guess they did. They slipped through them. Um, the Salton uh, Sea is expected to drop drastically. It's, um, uh, it's supposed to be maintained by the Imperial Irrigation District. And what they've decided to do is they're going to build a dam in the center of it, across the center of it, and then the the uh, the uh, they'll keep water in the in the northern part of it, and they're going to let the southern part dry out. And um, the stench from that will be accompanied by ultra-fine dust particles. And if exposed to desert winds, it would produce the worst particulate air pollution in the Western Hemisphere. Not just in the United States, not just in Arizona, but in the Western Hemisphere. So in other words, the the southwestern United States is going to stink. Well, not only that, hydrogen sulfide will kill you. Yeah, in fact, uh, do you know what's the knockdown uh, percentage of parts per million for hydrogen sulfide? It's very low. Five parts per million. In other words, one or two parts per million to smell. Five, your nose is going to hit the ground and you're going to break your nose because you're going to be unconscious before you even hit the ground. That's how hard it is. Yeah, and I did hear that some of the schools, uh, some of the students over near San Diego were complaining. But, you know, complaining about it and doing something about it are two different things. If they're getting hydrogen sulfide that far away, I would have expected uh, death reports. And I haven't seen anything, any deaths attributed to this um, hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, but the dosage, the the level that you need in order to smell. The the human nose is so sensitive to hydrogen sulfide, you can get parts per trillion you can smell. Uh, It's only when you get to parts per billion that it gets knocked down. Well, I know, but it's 200 miles away, so I would have expected some deaths over in Arizona. Oh, yeah, you mean in the immediate area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, my guess is that it's probably venting, and that vented air is moving up in a laminar flow and then going up in higher atmosphere and then coming back down again. My guess is what? it may not be creeping along the ground at me because hydrogen sulfide is pretty like gas. Well, yeah. Um, the um, it, In one article I read, they said, you remember when I talked to you about the uh, supersaturated lakes that occurred in Africa where the carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide uh, supersaturated Super, super yeah. saturated the water. Yes, and, yes. And then for one reason or another, they were disturbed and, and they, what is termed turned over. They said that what happened was the salt and sea turned over because of that seismic activity in Brawley. Exactly, yeah. And those, those kind of things can be really devastating, can't they? Well, yeah, because it, it, although hydrogen sulfide is a light gas, uh, carbon dioxide is not, and it'll smother you while you sleep. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's not good. Now the uh, we have Alexander Bachman uh, joining us too here. Uh, Alexander, tell us the latest news you have. Hi, Ann. Uh, well, Hi, just a quick comment on the salt and sea issue. You know, we're down here in Baja. Uh, the same thing happened. You know, after the Passover quake on uh, April fourth, two thousand and ten, we have reports from the the citizens south of Mexicali uh, that lived through the 7.4 uh, mega quake that we had on uh, on Easter Sunday, remember? Uh, 
Yeah. And yeah, we uh, filmed they, it here, and by the way, in North County, San Diego, a couple hundred miles away. I think it was 250 miles away. That moved the, the ground like we're on a giant rubber sheet. It was crazy, and it was yeah, very loud. Yeah, Baja California separated uh, about three meters away from the from the um, uh, North American plate. So, just in that quake alone. Now the thing is that people reported uh, sulfuric acid coming, uh, so uh, smells of sulfur and uh, sulfuric gases going in through their kitchen floor. So, yeah, in other words, this could be uh, it could actually be a, a physical hazard. We should actually have our fire departments probably testing with sniffers if there's a surge of ground-based uh, sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfide, et cetera, because you could have a measure release, say, to a shopping center or a building or a school, and then all of a sudden you could have a lot of people all of a sudden just get very ill or die. Well, I mean, just follow the, 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 the traces, uh, the animal die-offs, the kill-offs, uh, the, the species going down. Uh, for example, remember that um, in March, I think it was, uh, in um, Mount Shasta, near Mount Shasta, in uh, Shasta County, the entire uh, underground uh, water uh, deposits disappeared overnight. Really? Under the entire county. So, in other words, the groundwater disappeared. It the went into a cavern. Yes, yeah, so in other words, it, it evacuated to a, a cavern. Uh, when we uh, have Christina join us at the bottom of the hour, she'll talk about this because the sulfur releases these uh, giant sinkholes appearing like in Louisiana and elsewhere. The earth is changing dramatically. We had an interesting discussion the other day with Stan Deo on Tuesday, the first hour, yep. and people should listen to that program. We talked about some pretty technical things, but if you listen slowly, you'll understand that the earth is going through some really cataclysmic earth changes right now. And this is not a theory. We're actually observing it happening as it's happening. We're heading into an ice age. We're heading to a change where there's a lot more volcanism. The ozone layer is thinning, and we're not making it any better. When we put nanoparticle aluminum up in the upper atmosphere and punch a hole in it over Greenland, which causes a a Greenland lake because of strobing of ultraviolet light on July 12th and thereafter. Um, And some of this stuff is pretty... (laughs) If, if if somebody told you to write this as a script for a sci-fi movie, you'd say, nobody's going to read that. Nobody's going to believe it. But they're doing it. Yeah, exactly. And oddities such as the magnetic anomaly down in the, the southern uh, Indian Ocean, for example. Yeah, in the southern Atlantic, yeah, three million square miles. And it's getting closer and closer to the surface of the Earth. If that gets so close, places like uh, Rio de Janeiro and uh, southern uh, Brazil, that, if that came, came near the ground... It would not be compatible with life. I mean, people don't understand that this, if this came down to the ground surface over southern and South America, it could kill millions of people in a matter of hours. Right? Precisely. And uh, when we know that NASA knows about these four gaping holes in the magnetosphere... They found it, I think, five years ago. An, two, yeah. two, two, 2007, they ran through. They wouldn't report the data for a year. And they've had five satellites go through this giant gaping hole which owed at 24,000 miles is five times the diameter of Earth in the Earth's magnetosphere, the Bolshak magnetosphere. This is not theory out there. These are astronomical facts that we have to face. Back in a moment. I want to explain a couple things about the galaxy that most people may not be aware of. The um, the center of the galaxy of every galaxy is 2.5 percent of the mass of every galaxy. Uh, the 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 uh, there is a recycling of energy and matter that comes out of that through various bursts of energy at high or super high frequencies that comes out of that collapsing mass. In other words, it doesn't just keep on eating and eating and getting bigger and bigger. It actually sends all that energy through what's called torsion fields, which is fifth dimensional wormholes that actually go to our stars and our planets and actually feed energy and matter back to those planets. So there's a white hole that feeds from the black hole and it does it on a periodic basis. Okay? Uh, in other words, think of the planets and stars as little piglets and the black hole in the center is the mother pig. Okay? It's consuming all of these stars and everything, but it's also spewing out energy in different bursts at very high frequencies. When the change in the torsion field happens because the fifth dimensional space changes and you pass from south of the galactic plane to north, <clears throat> it changes the movement of the plasma in the stars and in the planet. Our planet's a nuclear reactor with a crust on it. 
in a thin blue line of air. So when you think of that, it's like pretty remarkable. I mean, anybody that realized how what miraculous it is that we are alive in this thin blue line of air, literally boiling in a universe with gamma bursts and cosmic background radiation and the solar wind. I mean, if the magnetosphere was gone for half an hour and you're outside with the sun, it wouldn't be your friend, you'd be dead. Um, so, Ed, let's talk about this for a minute because people need to understand just how fragile the idea of life on our planet is. Right. Well, the um, the Earth is composed of a uh, a core, an iron uh, nickel core that is rotating like a torus, and that is what is creating the uh, the magnetic lines of force that we call the magnetosphere, and they come out at the uh, North Pole and go in at the South Pole, or vice versa. On top of that is the um, is is the uh, mantle, and it's semi molten, and uh, it's got kinks in it. So it's not it's not um, just like a liquid. It's it's a liquid with chunks in it. And yeah, and it also has rivers. In other words, there's literally channels of magma that are semi liquid, almost like viscous, like jello, and there's chunks of semi solid where there are literally rivers of magma that flow in specific pathways through the mantle. Right, and then on top of that is the crust. Which and is, the crust yeah. is what we live on. And so now the crust, are, uh, the crust is two different types, though. We have continental crust, just like what I call uh, the best would be pineapple slices. And think of the oceans as being a thinner crust, where the magma is coming up under the center of the mid-oceanic ridges and flowing out, and then flowing out at a period of time, and then goes and then diving under the uh, continental. Uh, plates, or the you know, we call the pineapple slices, which are the continents. So there's a constant recycling of of this mantle material that's actually rising up to the center of the of the ocean, so the mid oceanic ridge, which is 23,000 mile long radiator. I call it radiator of, of these 20 million, 23 million uh, venting structures as high as a skyscraper, and then the magma shoots out and then gradually moves along. And you can see a zebra pattern where if you take a magnetometer, which they did after the Second World War, they're looking for submarines and U-boats, they discover that there's a zebra pattern where the magnetic flux lines change back and forth because roughly every 11,000 years, 11,500 years, the magnetic flux field shifts, and about every 700,000 years it shifts a lot, you know, it's not a complete shift. What we're about to face, though, is much more than just a magnetic shift. We're about to face uh, moving through the galactic plane where the actual dynamo of the Earth's magnetic field is actually changing gears. And this is the same area that also has a lot of debris, which is the asteroid belt where the asteroid struck the Earth and knocked off the dinosaurs. We're actually going through the same cycle at the same part of the cycle as the dinosaur 62 million years ago. Yeah, but they don't think the asteroid that's hitting for Earth that uh, we think is going to hit in mid-February is uh, more of a, um, they call it a torsion uh, scale of four, which means it will only be in a regional event. Oh, yeah, that's not that. I don't think that the asteroid, is, you know, the big rocks are part of the problem. I think the biggest thing that's going to be a danger to us is the loss of our shields like Star Trek. Um, uh, do we have Maria Consolo there? Yes. Christina, Christina Consola. Christina, we were talking earlier in the show about the sulfur smell, and you've got some really remarkable articles. It fits in perfectly with what Ann mentioned and Alexander Bachman. Can you tell us all about the sulfur smell that predates or warns of major superquakes? And historically, you sent me a really interesting research. You do great research that shows all the different dates when, you know, this is not rotting fish. So the rotting fish theory is a dead theory, okay? Uh, this is the Earth giving us a warning. You're going to have a big quake, Southern California, in northern Mexico. You're going to have a big superquake real soon. Yeah, it's a, a definitely interesting. A list that I compiled for uh, my show on Thursday with some of the uh, historical strong sulfur smells that had been mentioned in literature um, as far back as 1703 in Italy. Uh, the exact quote was, the earth here and there observed a split in cracks from which streams the evil odors of sulfur and bitumen and men in Anquilla most worthy of trust write that in many places after the earthquake, sulfur, and fire issued from the opened earth. This has been um, documented as occurring prior to many earthquakes, including the, the great earthquake of San Francisco 
in, uh, I believe it was 1908, and then the, uh, the New Madrid series or sequence. Um, in Hungary in 1763, it was reported, as well as a rise in the River Danube, um, and the river appeared to be boiling prior to the earthquake. In Santa Rosa in 1908, Lawson and others noted a, small, a strong smell of sulfur two days prior to the earthquake, and one by another famous researcher, Charles Kobe, who actually um, warned his family of another quake then uh, subsequently when he smelled a recurrence of this. In southern Germany uh, in 1911, same thing. Yeah, I think so, also uh, the a superquake that occurred down in Missouri, you know, I think it was what, eight, it was in 1811, that big superquake that struck there, which is actually the biggest quake, earthquake on the continent of the United States, uh, they smelled sulfur as well before that superquake, didn't they? Yes. And it was so, was so um, perplexing is, the, you know, China, Japan, the Soviet Union, Germany pay much more attention to this as uh, an earthquake precursor, the outgassing of various materials like methane and and, uh, and sulfur gases and, and radon. In fact, Japan even has a laboratory of earthquake chemistry where they study this. Uh -huh. We well, you know yeah. the reason is in North America, unless the 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 info news babes on FO or Fox News Network are called FO for false, or uh, MSNBC where the uh, or these other foolish networks they call the garbage news network GNN, where they actually if they don't put it on it's not real it doesn't actually really matter. So uh, we have a culture of what I call Google geniuses where if if you can Google it and find the answer it's probably true. Or if it's not in the news, it actually is probably a lie, which is pretty strange. Yeah, the, the U.S. is really far behind in, in this field of earthquake prediction, and, and um, it, it was actually... It doesn't need to be so. ...as far back as in China 3,000 years ago. Okay, let, let, me, let, let me explain the things that we could use to predict besides animals. You can see the torsion field. We have torsion field imaging in space. These are classified projects. The torsion field, which is literally the movement of the magnetic flux lines, you can actually see them with these imaging techniques. And when those flux lines move, uh, they can tell. They also have a magnetic satellite that the Japanese put up three and a half years ago. Those flux lines, right before the Santiago superquake that occurred a few years ago, they could see the South Pole magnetically disappear. It was like, where is it? It's not there. So these things happen beforehand. Here in California, they have these ground level, what we call telluric current sensors that actually sense the telluric currents flowing in the Earth. And if there's a current change across the fault lines, they know something's about to give. There's actually going to be a release of piezoelectric energy. So there, there's no reason. We actually have this, the science. We don't put the money into it. That's the problem. Or if it's classified, one agency doesn't talk to the other. So the, the guys in DARPA and the space-based projects that are all black op are not going to talk to the uh, to FEMA or anybody else about a coming quake. It's classified. We're not talking to you. Welcome back. And uh, so, uh, Christina, the let's tie this all together, panel, and figure out what's happening. The timeline is we're going to have major superquakes. The seismic report, in fact, I posted it up yesterday indicates from the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, one of the good things JASCO did was made sure that they had to respond to the seismic report. And it shows that roughly a third of our nuclear reactors, 104 in the United States, are within strike distance of a major earthquake fault line zone. Uh, that means Diablo Canyon and San Onofre are, you know, a nuclear reactor non gratis. In other words, we need to shut the damn things down and take the radioactive waste away before something really bad happens. Most of the reactors sitting around the New Madrid fault system, which are also releasing nasty uh, smelling gases and showing lots of these uh, what we call pre-superquake tremors, are indicating there's going to be a big quake on the New Madrid fault system, too. So we're just waiting for a, an American Fukushima. We also have in Japan uh, Mount Fuji, who is now the magma dome, and the Japanese know this, is filling. This is one of the nastiest volcanoes on the Earth, and the Japanese have known for millennia. When, Fu when Mount Fuji goes, they don't love it. They fear it as a monster. They used to think it was a monster. And when it unleashes, it can literally cover ash for hundreds of square miles radially away from Mount Fuji. 
this is going to be devastating. <clears throat> and it also, there's a fault line running right from Mount Fuji through the, uh, the Chiba factory, Chiba nuclear reactor site, which is again as big or bigger than Fukushima. Uh, if that happens, they're going to have major problems there on the Chiba reactors. And also, so, uh, Dr. Devo, uh, yeah. hi, Consuelo. We have Tarahiro Matsushita, uh, who was just assassinated. He was found hanging inside his home over there in Japan, Japan's finance minister. You're talking about Mr. Corruption, right? Let's go yeah. tell us the story, yeah. Tell us yeah. a story about that, because apparently he was involved with kind of like the backroom deal guy, and he knew too much, so they kind of... They, they, what they do in Japan is they don't double tap you with bullets and they don't make a kill they suicide you in other words they get you to write a suicide note and they hang you in your in your room or they do something to indicate the suicide this this is a strange culture they because the reason is the police don't investigate suicides no they don't they, do, they don't they do, they, do, they do investigate murders but in Japan if it's a suicide all oh, we know investigate no problem it's suicide obvious to see no no problem and that's it Nobody quits whether Yakuza did it or somebody because they had a contract killer. If you suicide in Japan, police no check nothing. And that's the reason why the suicide rate's so high. It's not because they're so nice. It's because if you piss somebody off over there, they're going to Arkansas you like they do in America around Hillary and and, uh, and Bill Clinton. They, and they want to restart the reactor. So basically, that's why you know these people are getting uh, whacked. Yeah, the, the the new director of the. Of the reactors that control uh, the uh, Daiichi and the Daini reactors, they want to start reactor five and six at Daiichi. They want to start all the Daini reactors. Uh, these guys are sitting right on fault lines, and their number of earthquakes has increased 500 percent since last March, a year and a half ago. Things aren't get quieting down. Earthquake center is like <clears throat> really rocking and rolling, and the Japanese know when they have these tremors. Like, what the hell's next? Well, what's next is bad. Okay, uh, you know, there's a, a little bit of a joke, you know, there, there's there's bad news and really bad news. The bad news is everything I've told you that's really bad is the mild part. The really bad news we don't actually know yet. No, it's, it's the new news. normal. The new normal is really, really, really bad. And what we can't anticipate is, and this is what I would suspect, in the next number of months we're going to have a big quake strike in San, the San Andreas Fault in California and New Madrid. We're going to have Mount Fuji blow. We're going to have these major quakes. And talk about this one down in Nicaragua. This is a plume of ash. is one of the biggest ones you mentioned that you've seen in many years in Nicaragua. And this is big enough that it actually could blot out the sun and actually change the climate of the planet. Yeah, it's happening right as we speak right now. Yeah, Mount, Mount Fuego, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it wasn't even on the map to erupt. I mean, they weren't even considering it. They had a big tourist center there. And uh, it erupted, and they had to evacuate. Well, they've evacuated so far about 50,000 people. Wow. Yeah, and last time it blew like eight, eight, eight or ten years ago, you know, uh, even a reporter died just because of uh, the ash. So that one's a dangerous one in itself. And, they say and nobody's talking perfect. about uh, about Iceland. Remember, now, Iceland's not is. They have the Ayajalcafoco and the Hekla volcanoes. Hekla means in. Uh, I guess uh, Danish, Norwegian, uh, Icelandic, it means the gates of hell. And when these volcanoes go, they're sulfur volcanoes. They put up uh, also, it basically is an exfoliant. It's much more efficient, in fact, than Agent Orange at exfoliating and killing foliage. It's also extremely toxic to your cells and mitochondria. So there's over 200 parts per million of, of fluoride in this, in this, as well as it's also containing uranium and other radioisotopes. So the ash that comes from Iceland is radioactive and super high in fluoride as well. And the nanoparticles, the shards of it will rip the hell out of an engine, a jet engine. So a jet engine that might get 2,000 air miles, you know, 2,000, what are the, 2,000 air miles before a check or something, will get like torn out in about like 20 times faster. So you can have an engine burnout or flare out where you're flying through a cloud and all of a sudden, oop, and unless you have what's called a special type of, of uh, radar, you can't see these little ash, these little clouds of little nanoparticle glass shards that will rip your engine apart. And then you have Anna Krakatau uh, about to blow any moment now? Krakatau. By the way, when Krakatau broke, broke blew, it actually caused, I think it was one or two summers where there was no... The, the snow stayed on the ground for, I think, one or two summers back in, was it 1804? Yes. Uh, no, a little bit later, I think, but it was later, the yeah. loudest it was, thing uh, ever heard on the planet Earth. 
Yeah, yeah, Krakatoa when it blew. That was up in uh, in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. And uh, was it Java or Sumatra when it when it blew? Yeah, it's it's uh, Indonesian volcanic change, Indonesia, but it's all yeah. on alert. I mean, nineteen of the volcanoes are on uh, on alert status right yeah. now. Now in Japan, there's 109 volcanoes. Like, whoa! Do you know where the most volcanoes on land are on the planet? What what uh, place they are? Underwater. No, I'm talking about on land. Oh. The largest number in any one area, state, country, whatever. Indonesia. Oregon. <laughs> well, here's another bad news. In Mexico, you know, the, the, the state that has more uh, volcanoes, uh, sleeping volcanoes in Mexico is Baja, California. <laughs> right, yeah. Baja, actually, the whole Baja was actually created volcanically. Yeah, we it's, got 22 volcanoes right here. Yeah. It's a interesting place. The whole Sea of Cortez was created volcanically. It's, that's one of the reasons why there's so much life there, because all the volcanic minerals, the Sea of Cortez is a massive place where the whales come from all over the world to actually migrate there, because with all those minerals, all the plant life and everything, it's, it's like a wonderland for, for the sea creatures, for tuna and for the large uh, whales and so on. Exactly. That's why Krakatoa is very important. I mean, there's a very good uh, PDF set that I have. I can email anybody that wants it. Just email me at abba at alexanderbachman.com on Krakatoa and the Tongues of Fire. It's prophecy research with respect to the activation of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, I mean, it's going on right now, and it's just a matter of time for the entire Ring of Fire to ignite, and we will really see the firework display. Uh, yeah, let's... Uh, let's- so thinking about that, let's give your website, Alexander Bachman, B-A-C-K-M-A-N dot com. Mm-hmm. Christina Consolo, your website is? FukushimaFacts.com. Now, the Fukushima situation, things are not getting any better. In fact, what I'm seeing is my radiation detector is now spiking very rapidly up into the 70s, which it hasn't done for like six months. And then it drops really quickly and back to the 30s, 40s, but it's not dropping back to the background, back to 22, something like that. So we're seeing what we call burst releases. Now what's happening, and I talked to um, Arnie Gunderson's wife, Maggie, what, what Arnie's concerned about right now is you have to balance between pumping nitrogen in to stop the critical reactions, and which will stop the hydrogen generation, or if you don't pump enough nitrogen in, you'll get hydrogen generated explosions. And those hydrogen generated explosions, now we've got proof, they actually can produce a nuclear explosion. A nuclear explosion, which is why the top of cooling pool uh, Three, which is a mock schooling pool, had a nuclear explosion there and a detonation a thousand miles per hour. What's <clears throat> what's going on with the uh, what's going on with the uh, reactors is they're spewing out more radiation. It's getting nastier. They have no idea where the corium is. The, there's no international action by Obama or the international community. The Japanese keep on lying and lying and lying. They actually have schools where. That's unbelievable the amount of radiation these kids are exposed to. Half of the children in Japan now have thyroid nodules in northern Japan. Half. Half of the children. It's genocide. And, and they're not growing. They can't produce growth hormone. These children are putting on minimal or no weight at all. They're not growing. A year and a half, no growth, or very minimal. If even the things stayed stable at that plant, they're going to run out of workers. In the next couple of five years, years they say years five years country, and by the way that would be the last of the workers they're going to run out long before then especially if their health they have major releases of radiation and their health gets so bad because even if you're suicidal you all you'll be capable of doing is drooling and staring if you get hit with enough radiation so yeah it's uh, it's very grim we better pray to the most high god to give us direction in this because i call this uh the year 2 PF, post Fukushima, and this is uh, a part of my trilogy book that will be coming out later this fall called Clan Iron, Time of Sorrows, which we are now in. <laughs> 